Welcome to Foley Lab tutorial number seven. This is going to uh, focus on uh, writing uh, a pretty simple program in Python, although actually it's going to be hopefully a pretty useful program too. So I decided to sort of stray away from the standard sort of like, let me teach you how to write uh, Hello World in Python because I figured that, you know, that could be found many, many other places around the internet and then also truth be told I'm, I'm sort of just learning Python myself so for me I've been uh, using it quite extensively in my uh, quantum mechanics class that I'm teaching right now and so if you're in my class hopefully this video is going to be useful and if you're just in Foley Lab or if you've just stumbled upon our YouTube page otherwise maybe it'll be useful as well um, anyway so what we're going to try to do today is illustrate some of the uh, features of Python and particularly in particular a couple uh, modules uh, NumPy and matplotlib to look at the quantum dynamics of an electron and an infinite square well and so that's what's kind of drawn schematically here um, let me just I'll get back into this uh, physical system in a minute but I'll just say that uh, one of the ways I've been trying to get up to speed on Python is with this computer science circles. This has been a really cool resource. So you can go through a lot of different lessons and just like learn how to program from scratch if you don't really know how to program at all or if you just want to learn Python. This is a pretty good way to learn Python too. There's a bunch of different uh, activities and you can track your progress and sort of that sort of stuff. So again, if you're in my quantum mechanics class right now, you're very familiar with this uh, website. Okay, so back to this problem. So I'm going to assume uh, if you're watching this, that you uh, at least have a, a basic grasp of quantum mechanics. Um, if you don't, uh, then I'm going to encourage you right now to go uh, get some knowledge on quantum mechanics because it's awesome. Uh, go pick up a book, watch some YouTube lectures, take a class. Uh, it'll change your life. Not even joking. Quantum mechanics is amazing. But anyway, what we're going to do is we're going to look at a really... Uh, common toy system uh, which imagines that uh, you've got a particle, maybe an electron, maybe some other particle, we'll consider it an electron here, um, confined uh, to this one limited region of the universe. So this is like a one-dimensional world, right? The electron can live only along the x-axis and for whatever reason there's only one region of space where the electron can actually exist and that's because there's these infinite potentials, which we call the infinite square well, which confines the electron. So if the electron happened to be, you know, in this green region, its potential energy would be infinite. That wouldn't make any physical sense, so it can't be there. Same thing over here. So if it were in this green region on the right, the potential energy would be infinite. That wouldn't make any physical sense. And everywhere in, the, in between these two green boxes, the potential energy is zero. And so we can actually have an electron exist only for values of x greater than zero and less than l because basically the potential energy goes to infinity at x equals zero and stays that way for all values of x smaller it goes to infinity for x equals l and stays that way for all values greater okay so it seems like a really silly system but actually it's a very uh, useful toy model um, for a lot of different reasons that i won't go into um, but another really great thing about it is that it's actually possible very simply to identify the possible states of well-defined energy that an electron can be in in this type of system and those are called the energy eigenstates and so the energy eigenstates basically just have this form right here they go as uh, sine of some integer n times pi times x over the length of the box and so if you play around with those functions you might notice one of the features of those functions is that they die at uh, x equals 0 and x equals l, meaning that um, uh, that the uh, amplitude of, of the state that describes the function goes to 0, therefore the probability density function for the particle goes to 0 at the boundaries. So one special thing about these functions is that they satisfy the appropriate boundary conditions. Uh, <clears throat> another useful feature of these functions is that they are orthonormal functions. So if I consider this integral here, uh, uh, psi of some uh, quantum number n uh, star of x, 
multiplied by psi of some other quantum number m of x dx integrated from 0 to l, then there's going to be two possible values of that integral. It's going to be 1 when the quantum number n is equal to m, and it's going to be 0 otherwise. So these functions form <clears throat> an orthonormal set. They also form a complete set, meaning that if I have sort of like any arbitrary function that I'm going to write big psi of x living in this domain between 0 and l, then I can actually uh, exactly represent that function in terms of some linear combination of um, my energy eigenstates in terms of these sine of n pi x over l. And so um, in particular, what we'll care about is the what we'll call the wave function of our system. So the electron can be in many different types of configurations, right? It doesn't have to have a well-defined energy. Um, it can be in some, in some arbitrary state defined by some wave function, big psi of x. And no matter what the form of that wave function is, as long as it's a well-behaved wave function in the domain 0 to L, we can actually write it as an expansion of the energy eigenfunctions. And then if we want to know, like, how do we actually find the specific expansion of the energy eigenfunctions that gives us this arbitrary state big psi of x, well, we can use basically the orthonormality property of those energy eigenfunctions, and we can compute the coefficients simply through this integral. So again, I'm going to take the integral of, uh, if, I'm, if I'm interested in the coefficient behind uh, the nth energy eigenfunction, so let's say I'm interested in the second energy eigenfunction where n is equal to 2. So the coefficient for energy eigenfunction 2 would be psi sub 2 star uh, multiplied by the entire uh, wave function that describes my system, dx integrated from 0 to L. So, um, and then I could be, simply do that for a variety of different quantum numbers, and I would get um, uh, a variety of different coefficients. Those coefficients, <clears throat> when uh, used to evaluate the sum, would reproduce the wave function of interest. So one of the things that we'll do uh, eventually, and I say eventually because this tutorial is going to be in two parts, the first part is we're just going to basically construct um, that combination, which I'll call a superposition of these energy eigenfunctions and verify that it actually reproduces a state of interest. But the second thing that we're going to do is then once we've created an initial state of interest, we're going to watch how it evolves in time. And <clears throat> it's particularly convenient to build um, your state out of these energy eigenfunctions because they have a, a particularly simple um, way that they evolve in time. And so I, I'll briefly remind you that each of these energy eigenfunctions, uh, psi sub n, has a well-defined energy e sub n. Um, it's related to the square of whatever this n is multiplied by some constants divided by the length squared. Um, <clears throat> Needless to say, you can find this value of E, and, um, and so how does this particular state, how does this energy eigenfunction evolve, evolve in time? Well, it just evolves in time according to this complex exponential. So it sort of has this os uh, oscillatory uh, time dependence, um, and we, we know that. So, um, <clears throat> so that means if we can build our initial state at some initial time, in terms of these energy eigenfunctions that have a well-known time dependence, then we actually know the time dependence of the entire state um, for all time. So that's going to be our goal. So what we'll do is we'll consider a very particular initial state, which is that of a Gaussian wave packet. Um, and so we'll write basically the configuration of our system, this big psi of x at time t equals 0 is just given by this Gaussian function Right, some function which is centered at a particular value of x, uh, which I'll call x naught, and it has some width about x, so it's not perfectly localized. Right, it's got some spread in space, and then I'm going to multiply this Gaussian function by one more complex exponential. So this exponential exponential of i times k naught times x. Uh, what this is is uh, this is a plane wave component. So what this uh, what this is, is, is some contribution 
of uh, a wave function that has momentum. And this isn't going to give us a, uh, a wave function that has a perfectly well-defined momentum because this spatial part is going to be confined in space. So this will not be some sort of infinitely extended wave function, which is what's required to have a, a well-defined momentum. But what will be the significance of this exponential of i k0 times x is that this value of k0 will be related to sort of the average momentum, the central momentum of this wave packet. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, one thing that you can realize is that, okay, this, is, this Gaussian term, the spatial term, is a real function, but then of course this exponential of i k0 is a complex function. So one way to visualize what that, that uh, e to the i k0 does to your wave function is it kind of gives it this little twist in the complex plane. So actually this is a really cool um, visualization of wave packets that I highly encourage you to watch if you, uh, if you think you'd benefit from such a uh, visualization. But anyway, so what you can imagine is that this Gaussian wave packet looks approximately like this, right? It's got some, some spread in space from the Gaussian contribution, and this e to the i k0 gives it a little twist into the complex uh, plane. And basically, <clears throat> how tight that twist is is going to be related to the magnitude of k. And the direction that it twists is going to be related to the sine of k. So a positive k is going to have uh, a twist, which is, I'm going to guess clockwise and negative k is counterclockwise but it's going to be one or the other uh, i'll leave it to you to fact check me and uh and you can leave in the comments if i was wrong in my assumption okay <clears throat> so that's the game plan right we're gonna we're gonna sort of state as a fact that our initial wave function um, has this functional form and then we're going to seek to find the expansion of particle in a box, energy eigenfunctions, which reproduces this Gaussian uh, with, a, uh, with an average momentum. Okay, and then once we know that expansion, then what we can actually do is just uh, have a computer run through various values of time, right, which is going to modify this little time-dependent part of our wave function expansion, which is going to modulate the overall Gaussian wave packet and give it uh, us its dynamics. Okay, so actually doing the dynamics is going to be the second part of this tutorial. The first part of this tutorial is simply going to focus on building this expansion and um, in validating that we have a proper expansion. So, <clears throat> so I'm going to post two more tutorials. Um, the first uh, additional tutorial is actually going to be writing the code to create this uh, expansion and validate it. And then the second part, uh, second additional tutorial, we'll be back uh, to trying to animate this. So stay tuned for two more tutorials.